Have you ever wondered why they add salt to icy sidewalks and roads in winter? It helps melt the ice by lowering the freezing point of water. This is a classic example of a colligative property of a solution. So colligative properties are properties of solutions that depend solely on the number of solute particles that are dissolved and not on the identity of that particle. This means that we see changes in colligative properties like boiling point or freezing point for the solution that are directly proportional to the concentration of the solution. We'll be looking at four colligative properties, vapor pressure lowering, boiling point elevation, freezing point depression, and osmotic pressure. Let's start with vapor pressure lowering. Remember that the vapor pressure of a liquid is the pressure of the gas phase above the liquid when the rate of evaporation and condensation are in equilibrium with each other. And this flask on the left depicts the dynamic equilibrium state for pure water. Notice the arrows pointing in each direction. These represent equal rates of evaporation and condensation, and that leads to a steady state pressure of water vapor over the liquid in this sealed container. Now, on the right, there's a non-volatile solute added to the flask. So the solute particles are purple in this solution. They're non-volatile in this example, and that means that they don't evaporate. So the only particles that we find in the vapor phase above the solution are going to be for the solvent, for water. And notice that there are fewer water molecules above the surface of the liquid. This is because there are fewer water molecules at the surface able to evaporate. We've replaced some of those water molecules with non-volatile solute particles. And if there are fewer liquid solvent particles at the surface, then there are fewer solvent particles able to evaporate. The net result is that the number of gas particles above the liquid, and therefore the vapor pressure, drop. How much the vapor pressure drops depends on the number of solute particles dissolved in the solution. The more solute particles, the lower the vapor pressure. We can quantify how much the vapor pressure drops in a solution compared to the pure solvent using Raoult's law. It states that the vapor pressure of a volatile solvent above a solution is equal to its normal vapor pressure multiplied by the mole fraction in the solution. So the mathematical equation is represented here, where the vapor pressure of the solvent component in the solution is equal to the mole fraction of the solvent, which is represented with the Greek letter chi. And remember that mole fraction is simply equal to the moles of the solvent, in this case, divided by the total moles of the solution. So moles of solvent plus moles of solute. We multiply this by the vapor pressure of the pure solvent, also known as the normal vapor pressure. And it's represented here with the degree symbol to indicate that this is the pure solvent vapor pressure. Now, the mole fraction of the solvent will always be less than one for a solution, which means when we multiply it by the vapor pressure of the pure solvent, we will find that the vapor pressure of the solvent in solution is always going to be less than the pure vapor pressure. Let's look at an example calculation. We'll calculate the vapor pressure of a solution made by dissolving 25 grams of glucose in 215 grams of water at 50 degrees Celsius. We're given the relevant molar masses as well as the vapor pressure of pure water at 50 degrees. So our starting points will be the masses of the pure water and glucose, our solute and our solvent. And we know that in order to find the vapor pressure of water, which is our solvent, 
over the solution, we'll need to use Raoult's law. We're given the vapor pressure of pure water, which we can substitute directly into our equation, but we need to calculate the mole fraction due to water, our x, our chi term. So to calculate mole fraction, we need to know the number of moles of both our solute and solvent. So we're going to have moles of water in the numerator divided by the total moles of our solution in the denominator. We convert grams of water into moles of water by dividing by the molar mass of H2O, 18.02 grams. Our units of grams will cancel out, and we'll be left with 11.93 moles of water. We do a similar calculation for glucose. 25 grams of glucose times one mole divided by the molar mass of glucose, 180.2 grams. Again, our units of grams cancel out, and we're left with units of moles for glucose. We then use these values to calculate the mole fraction of water. And again, it's the moles of water that have to be in the numerator. This is going to give us a value that's close to 1, but not quite there. Once we've calculated our mole fraction due to water, we can substitute this into Raoult's law. So we get that the vapor pressure of water in the solution is equal to the mole fraction, 0 0.9885 times 92.5 torr, which is the vapor pressure of the pure water that was given to us in the problem. And we have a vapor pressure over that solution for water of 91.4 torr. We round to three significant figures, which is the least number of significant figures for any of the measurements that we used in the problem. So the vapor pressure lowering of a solution actually influences its boiling point as well. Remember that a liquid boils when its vapor pressure equals the atmospheric pressure. And the normal boiling point of a liquid reflects the temperature at which the vapor pressure of that substance is equal to normal atmospheric pressure, which is 760 torr or 101 kilopascals. But for a solution, the vapor pressure at any given temperature is always going to be less than that of the pure substance. So the vapor pressure line for a solution is actually shifted downward from its solvent on graphs like these. For example, if the vapor pressure of pure water is 101 kilopascals at 100 degrees, the vapor pressure at that same temperature for a solution with water of the solvent is always going to be less than that 101 kilopascals. And we'll see that effect at all the different temperatures we might look at. And what that means is that the curve ultimately is going to be shifted down, and as we get to higher and higher temperatures, to the right of the pure solvent curve. So in order to get my solution that I've just drawn in here, that curve to 101 kilopascals, normal atmospheric pressure, I am going to have to raise the temperature even higher. This is the basis of our second colligative property, boiling point elevation. This phase diagram shows that the same effect influences the freezing point as well. The solid blue line represents the phase transitions of the pure solvent. The dashed lines represent the shift for a solution made with that solvent. So we can see that the uh, line between the liquid and gas phase for the solution is actually shifted 
lower than it is for the pure solvent. Because of this shift, it now intersects with the line for the solid gas transition at a lower temperature. And as a result, now, the line between the solid and the liquid phase is shifted to lower temperatures. So boiling point is higher for a solution while the freezing point is lower. The difference in temperature that these phase transitions undergo can be related directly to the concentration of the solute particles in the solution. In this case, the change in temperature, which is represented as delta T, equals the molality of the solution, represented with a lowercase m, times either Kf or Kb. Kf and Kb represent constants for either freezing point depression or boiling point ele elevation, and they are experimentally determined and specific to the solvent that is being used. So in these formulas, the difference in temperature delta T is always calculated so that it is always positive. This means that for the freezing point formula delta Tf, it equals the freezing point of the pure solvent, which is higher, minus the solution, which is lower. It's switched for the boiling point elevation, delta Tb. It is the boiling point of the solution, which is higher, minus the boiling point of the solvent, which is lower. Let's start with a simple example. Antifreeze is often made out of ethylene glycol. If we have a 1.7 molal solution of aqueous ethylene glycol, what is the freezing point of the solution? In this problem, we're given two major pieces of information. The concentration of the solution in units of molality, that's what the lowercase m stands for, and the freezing point depression constant, Kf, for water. This is an aqueous solution, so that means that our solvent is water. We're asked to find the new freezing point of the solution. In order to do this, we need to use the freezing point depression formula. And the calculation is fairly straightforward. We just substitute the given concentration and constant into the formula, and we find that the freezing point depression is 3.2 degrees Celsius. Notice, notice that our units do cancel out. Units of molality cancel out with the molality, the lowercase m, in the Kf unit. Now it's important to note that delta Tf is not the actual freezing point of the solution. It's just the difference in temperature between the freezing point of the solvent, in this case water, and the solution. Our last step is to calculate the new freezing point of the solution. And to do this, we actually do need to know the freezing point of the pure solvent. Again, it's an aqueous solution. Our solvent is water, and we know this freezes at zero degrees Celsius. If you are ever in doubt, though, as to the freezing or boiling point of the pure solvent you're working with, please make sure to look it up. So in order to calculate the freezing point of the solution, we substitute the zero degrees Celsius for our pure solvent into our formula for delta Tf. And we know that the solution is 3.2 degrees Celsius lower than the pure solvent. That means that the freezing point of our solution is negative 3.2 degrees Celsius. The last step is easy to forget. It's a good idea to double check that your final answer is actually lower than the freezing point of the pure solvent. It is, so we're good. Let's do another example. 
This time we want to know how many grams of ethylene glycol need to be added to one kilogram of water to give a solution that boils at 105 degrees Celsius. And we're given several pieces of information to solve this. We're told the mass of the solvent water. We're also given the new boiling point of the solution that we want, 105 degrees Celsius, and the boiling point elevation constant for our solvent water. We also are given the molar mass of our solute, ethylene glycol, 62.07 grams per mole. You could calculate this, though, because you know the formula. We're not given the boiling point of our pure solvent, water, but you should know this already. This is 100 degrees Celsius. All right, now we need to solve for mass of ethylene glycol in units of grams. Now we know we're dealing with boiling point elevation, so we'll use this formula. The M in the formula does stand for molality, not mass. We don't see mass in this particular formula for our solute, but we can solve for everything that we can in the formula and ultimately we'll be able to work our way back to the mass of the solute. So let's substitute in the information that we actually have. We can calculate our boiling point elevation delta TB by taking the boiling point of the solution, 105 degrees, and subtracting from it the pure solvent. So this is going to reduce, this term in parentheses is going to reduce to 5 degrees Celsius for our delta TB value. We can set that equal to, on the other side, the molality of the solution, which we don't know yet, times the boiling point elevation constant, Kb. We'll solve for our unknown molality by dividing both sides by the Kb value. So 5 degrees Celsius divided by 0 0.512 degrees Celsius per unit molality gives us a value of 9.77 for the molality of the solution we need. Now remember that molality, that lowercase m, actually stands for moles of solute per kilogram of solvent. Now, we have a unit or a value for the concentration side. We also know the mass of our solvent, the denominator on the right-hand side which means that we can solve for the moles of our solute, which is ethylene glycol. And if we can solve for moles of solute, we can certainly convert that into grams of solute. So let's do that calculation. I'm going to show this to you in a slightly rearranged form. We're solving for moles of solute, the numerator here. So what we would have to do is multiply our kilograms of solvent times the molality. So here's that calculation written out so that the units cancel out. We're going to start with the kilograms of the solvent, the denominator in our ratio. We're going to multiply that by our molality. And here I've converted the units of molality into their ratio form. So 9.77 moles of our solute, ethylene glycol, divided by one kilogram of water. Our units, kilograms, actually cancel out here. We're going to be left with moles of ethylene glycol. 9.77 in this case. We can convert this into grams simply by multiplying by the molar mass of ethylene glycol. Our units of moles will cancel out and we will be left with 6.1 times 10 to the second grams of ethylene glycol, 610. This is rounded to two significant figures to reflect the least number of significant figures in the measurements we use in our calculations associated with the mass of the water. The last colligative property is osmotic pressure. And this is defined as the amount of pressure needed to keep osmotic flow from taking place. Where osmosis or osmotic flow is simply the flow of solvent from a solution of lower concentration to one of higher concentration. 
So this picture of solutions in a U-tube offers a nice visual representation of osmotic pressure. On the right hand side of the U-tubes, we have a solution that's made up of a solute in purple and a solvent, which is the smaller yellow particles. On the right hand side of the U-tube, we actually have the pure solvent representing our solution with a lower concentration, which means no concentration in this case of solute particles. Separating the two halves is a semi-permeable membrane. This is a membrane that allows the solvent to pass through, but not the solute. In osmotic flow, the solvent passes from the solution of lower concentration into the one of higher concentration. So it goes from the left-hand side of the tube into the right-hand side. And one way of describing this flow is in response to a thirsty solution. It's a great description. Solutions with higher solute concentrations draw in solvent, which is usually water, to themselves. It reflects the natural tendency of things to mix over time. In this case, the solvent has a tendency to mix with the solution, thereby decreasing the concentration of the solution over time. And because the solvent can move across the semi-permeable membrane into the solution, but the solute particles cannot go in the reverse direction, the level of the fluid on the right-hand side of the U-tube increases. And we see this in the second U-tube, which represents the final diluted solution at equilibrium. The extra fluid on the right actually produces a pressure on the solvent on the left side of the tube that eventually stops it from slowing or excuse me, stops it from flowing into solution. And this is osmotic pressure. It's the pressure associated with the additional height of the liquid on the right-hand side of the tube at equilibrium. The osmotic pressure, which is denoted with the capital Greek letter pi, is directly proportional to the molarity of the solution, capital M, times the ideal gas constant, R, times the temperature of the solution. So in this calculation, the units do matter. Molarity, as you should know, is units of moles of solute per liter of solution. The ideal gas constant that we use is 0.08206, atmospheres times liters divided by moles divided by Kelvin. This will allow us to cancel out the liters and moles in our molarity concentration. But it also indicates that we have to use a temperature that's been converted into units of Kelvin. Our final osmotic pressure then will be in units of atmospheres. Now let's calculate the osmotic pressure associated with a solution that contains 18.75 milligrams of hemoglobin in 15 milliliters of solution at 25 degrees Celsius. And we're given several key pieces of information here. We're told the mass of the solute and the volume of the solution, the temperature, and we're also given the molar mass of hemoglobin, 6.5 times 10 to the fourth grams per mole. This is a really large protein. In order to find our osmotic pressure, we have to use the osmotic pressure formula. And of course, we know that capital M stands for molarity, which will be moles of hemoglobin per liter of solution. R is the ideal gas constant with units of atmospheres times liters divided by moles divided by Kelvin. And our temperature then will have to be in units of Kelvin. So it'll be our degrees Celsius plus 273.15. So we'll do this conversion first. 25 plus 273.15 gives us a temperature for our formula of 298.15 Kelvin. Next, we're going to calculate the molarity. 
So I'm doing this in one combined formula, but you can do the numerator separately from the denominator and then substitute in if you prefer. In the numerator, I have to convert from milligrams of hemoglobin into moles of hemoglobin, first by converting from milligrams to grams, so I divide by 1,000, and then I'll convert into moles by dividing by the molar mass of hemoglobin, and my units of grams will cancel out as well. In the denominator, I need to have liters of solution, so I will convert milliliters to liters by dividing by 1,000. What this should leave me with is 2.8846 times 10 to the negative 7 moles divided by 0 0.0150 liters. This reduces to 1.923 times 10 to the negative 5 moles per liter. We can now use the osmotic pressure formula. Our units for molarity are going to cancel out with the ideal gas constant, moles and liters. Our temperature units will also cancel out, and we'll be left with final units for osmotic pressure of atmospheres, ATM. So our final answer is 4.7 times 10 to the negative 4 atmospheres. We've rounded to two significant figures to match the least number of significant figures in our measurement. And this is the amount of pressure that's needed to stop osmotic flow of water into a solution of hemoglobin that contains 18.75 milligrams per every 15 milliliters. In summary, colligative properties of solution are influenced by the concentration of solute particles dissolved in the solution. And we can calculate the degree to which they are influenced using mathematical formulas. For vapor pressure lowering, the vapor pressure of a solvent over a solution is equal to the mole fraction of that solvent in the solution times the vapor pressure of the pure solvent denoted here with a degree sign. For boiling point elevation, the difference in boiling point between the solution and the pure solvent, delta Tb, is equal to a boiling point elevation constant, Kb, times the molality of the solution which is moles of the solute per kilogram of the solvent. Freezing point depression follows a similar calculation with the difference in freezing point of the pure solvent and the solution, or delta Tf, equal to a freezing point depression constant, Kf, times the molality of the solution. And finally, osmotic pressure, or the pressure needed to stop osmotic flow of the pure solvent into a solution, is equal to the molarity of the solution times the ideal gas constant in units of liters times atmospheres divided by moles divided by Kelvin times temperature.